Hey everyone, I bet you're wondering what this thing is. So this is a speaker hanger and I use these for um, spraying cabinets and uh, what it does is, is it gives me access all around the cabinet including the underside to spray in one uh, deal. So this is how it works. And there is a real story here, but I thought I'd show you this first and I'll show you what exactly I'm going to do with it all. So this is, uh, oh, I should probably explain this a little bit. This is just made out of one by four and some scrap plywood. And um, this is a piece of, uh, that's probably half inch electrical conduit. And this is, I think, probably one inch PVC electrical conduit. Some stuff I had laying around. You know, I have lots of stuff laying around, right? So the way this works is I, I use this piece of conduit, put it through the tweeter hole, and in this case the port hole, and that gives me a handle. I can pick this up and slide it over that, and I put this on the outside, you know, I do this outside on a, on a table I have set up on some sawhorses. And uh, so what that does is it gives me a way to spray underneath, spray all the way around, and also spray the front. Then when I'm done spraying, I can grab this, and I usually do it with uh, gloves, obviously, because there's going to be wet finish on there, and I can just slide that off, and then take this and hang it right where my hands are hanging on two sawhorses. So that gives a way to spray the whole thing. And so, enough about that. There's a number of ways you could do that. Not the only way, but it's the way I found it. Pretty convenient. So, uh, today's video, or this video, and I'll actually span a couple, three days, will be about finishing the other set of oak speakers that I did in the very first veneer video. That was so long that I didn't post it on, on YouTube, and actually its replacement ended up being nearly as long. So, anyway, that's just my lot in life, it seems. So, uh, I've been thinking of ways to do finishes that are, would be fairly accessible to most people. I'm, I'm probably going to do some finishes that aren't very accessible, but uh, uh, I thought this might be a good one to, to show, and, and that way maybe uh, someone can utilize this and, and do their own speakers. So red oak cabinets, you've seen those before. The other thing you're going to use, Rust-Oleum flat black. I don't really have an affinity to Rust-Oleum. It's good paint, I know that, for spray can paint. And I have it. Um, I hope there's enough. I got about probably half a can, maybe three quarters of a can there, and I need to spray both speakers. And when I say spray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a light but thorough coat over the whole thing. And we're going to end up with um, what's called a rubbed, a rubbed off finish. Or a, it's um, a way to add a little bit of distressing and uniqueness that's real popular in furniture right now. And uh, we'll, we'll get there and you'll see how that kind of unfolds. Then top coat will be finish up, which you saw in another video. If you watched my other uh, finishing video, you saw this. This is a water-based polyurethane. This is their flat sheen. And one thing I should probably mention, anything that has, uh, that says flat or satin or anything like that, it's gonna have what's called, um, what is it called? Flatting compounds in it and those flatting compounds fall out of suspension so you want to make sure whatever product you're using that you're either stirring it if it or you can shake this stuff as long as you don't use it immediately and uh, so anyway a word to the wise there and then another we'll come to a, a fork in the road where you can take the finish two different ways and the way i'm going to do is the more elaborate really peter doing elaborate stuff yeah, I think so. Anyway, I'm um, going to use trans tint. And as always, I'll put photos and links where you can uh, look at this stuff. And then I'll leave the resourcing of it up to you. There's a number of places you can get trans tint. This is made by a company called Homestead Finishing. And uh, I think he sells on 
eBay as well as through stores. Anyway, not, not too difficult to find. It's gonna dilute that in denatured alcohol, even though it says fuel. It's denatured alcohol. That's what they used to call white gas. Uh, if you ever had an old pump up uh, camp stove, that's, that's the fuel that went in. So those are the things that we'll be using. So next video I'm gonna set up and uh, I'm just gonna spray paint these and uh, pretty um, uneventful to watch, I imagine. And I may fast forward through it, but uh, we'll get them black, let them dry overnight and then come back on another segment and I'll show you the, the, the fork in the road if that makes any sense. So uh, next you're gonna see is spray painting. Ooh. Hello again, folks. It's, it's the next day, and uh, you're probably looking at this going, wow, look at that. He has one speaker that looks really pretty good, and the other one that, wow, looks like it got pretty beat up. So this is, this is the rub through part. I already did one just to save a little time in the video. Once you see how I do it, it's not, not a whole lot to the technique, and it's kind of personalized. So if you want to change it to your sensibilities, whatever those might be, you can do it. Uh, so these areas, I, I literally did sand through with sandpaper and, and uh, um, red Scotch-Brite to make this look warm. The whole thing with, with um, rub through is it's intended to mimic what would be coming from long-term wear. And I'm, I'm gonna rub my face here because I got an itch on my nose. But I'm not gonna do it with my hand. So anyway, <laughs> now it's become sort of a, a feature in a lot of furniture and you know how you would ever get up close to a speaker and rub it enough to rub the finish off. That's a, another question. But so this is, this is the next step. And, and this is one that hasn't been touched. And so this is where the fork in the road comes. If you wanted to have that grain showing like it is right there and, uh, and just have these entirely black, oh, my nose really itches, um, then the thing to do would be to, to lightly sand this and then one more coat, oh, which I'll tell you too. I, this took almost an entire can of paint. And so if you're going to paint them, I would say, if you're going to do this finish and then clear right over this instead of following the other <laughs> the other path, um, then I would say buy two cans of paint. You want to get the paint on there even and get coverage on everything. And by the way, I did put two coats on. And the, the second coat, 
I went opposite direction. So I, I stroked and you probably saw in the video, I went up and down all around the speaker and then across here. Well, I would make an effort to go the other direction when you spray the second coat. What you're trying to do is get the spray down in the open parts of that grain because you want that to stay black no matter what. If, so just, just bear in mind that if you're seeing any of the grain when you're done, if you're taking these to this level or this method, then you probably need to recoat. But you don't need gobs of paint, it just needs to be thorough coverage. So. How did I get from that to that? That's what I'm going to show you now. And then we're going to go on to coloring these areas, something other than the, what they are now. And that can be anything you want. In, in this case, I'm going to do kind of a deep blue or indigo color, which is something somebody on Audio Circle suggested, and I thought it might look interesting. We'll see. I, I, I think the, it'll be unusual to say the least. So I'm going to set this one aside. And so first I think I'll demonstrate what I would do if I wanted these to be black and this clear coat over the top of them. Now all this is intended to show grain. So you're not filling grain. The idea is to not fill the grain, show the grain, but not have it be a different color like it would be if it were raw wood. I, and a lot of, in the marketing end of speakers and other furniture, they used to call this ash finish. And ash actually would have a little bit different grain pattern, but has much the same characteristics when it comes to the openness of the grain. Forgive me for scratching my nose. Um, so if you've watched my other videos, you'll, you'll recognize this guy. This is a 180, degree, 180 grit sponge. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sand this flat. And whenever you put first coat of anything on, it raises grain. Not raises grain, but, but raises the fiber in the grain a little bit. So you want, to, you want to flatten that out before you proceed with more coats. And that's pretty easy with one of these sponges. And by the way, this is dirty work. You're going to get black all over. So don't do it on your white couch. Probably do it outside the house if, if you don't want it anyhow. So I don't know if that's real evident, but you can kind of see there the difference. I should, I'll, I'll do another part of it and show you. So I'm just trying to take off the, the sanding fibers, but not remove any of the paint down to the wood. So I'm going to do half of this. And this will, by the way, plug up your sanding block. And I, I blow those out with a uh, compressor, which you'll probably see me do here. Well, there you can kind of see when that flattens off, it, it hits the high spots, but leaves some of the low spots, which isn't going to be a big deal because that, that's the grain you want showing through. So I'll continue with that. And remember, this is if you are going to you wanted them black, which would be a nice way to go, really. I, um, I just wanted to experiment with something. And again, I've never done this to a pair of speakers before. I've only experimented with, with this elsewhere. So, and you're going to need a, a couple of things. I would recommend gloves or plan on washing your hands afterwards. And throughout the process, you need to kind of eyeball along the way. So that's why I'm using this just to get the sanding dust off of there so I can see what's going on. And actually right here, I'm seeing a little bit of a, a sag in my paint job. So it happens. And you can see how that sponge loads up. And the, the sanding at that point becomes less effective. blow this off. This is probably going to sound pretty bad. If you don't have a compressor and a way to blow that out, uh, I guess you could, I, I have also just banged it hard on a surface uh, and that'll, that'll help. It, 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 air really works the best. So 
here I'm going to be careful and I want to sand that whole radius, but I don't want to sand through it. So I'm barely putting pressure on that. I'm just letting the weight of my hand essentially sand that. And this will actually bring it to a really smooth surface. Ready for clear finish. And using clear over colors is a nice way to get a good looking sheen, but not have to deal with the color other than the very first steps of the finish. If you look at the automotive finishing world, that's how cars are painted now. They're, it's called base coat, clear coat. And so base coat is the color coat and clear is the protective coat that also gives depth to the finish, makes it look a lot nicer. Okay, so there's almost all of it. Well, not almost all of it, some of it. So this step would be kind of optional if you're gonna go that route. But the key is not rolling over the edge. If you wanna keep it black, you don't wanna sand through this color anywhere. And if you did, if you were going this route, then like I said, I think I'd probably recommend another tote, coat at least to touch up. And it doesn't really matter what the surface looks like at this point because the clear coats are going to provide the sheen and the depth, not the, not the base color. So it, you could use gloss black if you wanted to, any kind of black, but black in this case is the key to making that work and you'll see why. Or I'll keep tell you why. When you put colors on top of black, the black does a pretty good job of blocking all the other colors. So even though we're gonna color those blue, I'm actually gonna color the whole cabinet and the black will be the dominant color there. So it won't look blue except on the areas where it's lighter colored now. Uh, I hope all that is clear. It will be soon enough. Okay, I think, did I do that? Yeah, okay, so there's a whole speaker. If, like I said, if, if you wanted to keep these just black like that, I think the thing to do would be to spray another coat, a light but thorough coat on top, and then another, just barely touch them with sandpaper. It could either be, oh, it could be 220 or 320 grit, or it could be something like this. Just be careful you don't roll over those sharp edges because it'll immediately take the paint off. And, and I'm using paint here specifically because I'm trying to do finishes that are easy to duplicate. So now for the fun part. Let me blow this off. So well, here's where we get to be kind of destructive. And you've got sort of a practice area on the bottom. That's probably never going to be seen. So if you're, if you're wondering about the process and not exactly sure how it'll unfold, then the bottom's a good place to start. So what I'm doing, this is 150 grit sandpaper. And by the way, these cabinets were sanded with 150 throughout before I started. And I, this is totally random and it's going to be different for everybody that does it. And you just take this sandpaper and I kind of imagine what it would look like if I rubbed on this or had something rubbing on it over a long period of time and how that would look. It, I guess what I'm trying to say is you don't want it to look like a mistake, yet it, 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 it kind of is a, a, an odd thing to do to, to finishing, but that's just the way the finishing world is. So, you know, I come up near a corner and I just start sanding until I get down to wood. And that can be any shape. I would not recommend that you go around and around or, or cross grain with the coarser sandpaper. You'll see me do it with this stuff, but so, I'm just putting pressure on my finger. You could wrap this around a sponge or all kinds of different ways to accomplish this, I suppose. Use your imagination. That's, that's what I'd always encourage, I guess. I think probably one of the hardest things to accomplish in stuff like this is you want to make it look like it kind of occurred naturally, but yet 
you're, it's very synthetic in the way we accomplish it. So there is what it's like with the sandpaper. Now to my eye, you can definitely see areas where that looks like this motion was what was at work. And I prefer that to look a little more definite in terms of direction. So that's where I'll use Scotch-Brite, red Scotch-Brite. And I'll go, I'll sort of try and open those areas up for lack of a better description. So I'm going kind of diagonally at 45 degree angle. And I just sort of watch how they kind of unfold in front of me. And I, I do that with no particular methodology other than I just want it to change the look. So, and, and you're gonna wanna use some kind of a, you know, don't use the good towels, I would say, but some way to wipe off your sanding residue because it'll kind of shade things. So, you can see, you know, I want these blends to be, uh, what do I wanna say, fades, not, not sharp edges, but, but I want it to fade from one to the other. And here, here's a good example. That, that fade looks pretty organic to me. This one over here, that actually doesn't, so uh, I, I do this randomly. And it, it, the nice thing about this is you can't make too many mistakes. Now there I just changed the character of that by kind of blurring the edges a little bit. And with this fine of uh, grit, you don't need to worry too much about sanding, although, or across the grain sanding. Although if it looks, if you see definite cross grain scratches, it might be worthwhile to spend a little time and, and take them out. Either go back to the sandpaper or just with this. It's a really forgiving process, which, you know, is nice in wood finishing because in fine wood finishing, um, forgiving is often not a characteristic that m many people would say was there. And if this was really being rubbed through by some kind of wear and tear over, over the years, the edges would definitely get some of that. So I'm careful to kind of leave those. You can take the edges down to wood really fast with something like this. So. Um, it probably isn't even necessary to, to use the sandpaper. Just use this if you're going to do that. And I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. And you can see why I'm wearing an apron. This is dirty process, really, really dirty. It's because you're just making a whole bunch of black dust. And there is, you can kind of see what I've done. And here I'll, I'll do what I would call blending. And there I ro roll over the edge a little bit to kind of take some black off of there. So give your arm a workout too. And there you can see how I kind of feathered those out to the edges and this looks like a little sharp line to me. This looks okay. So use your own sensitivity here. I, I really can't instruct on how to do things randomly. That's going to, that's going to happen on your workbench. So here I'm going to, I'm going to try and blend this out just a little bit or fade it out. Maybe is a better way to state that. So there you can see the result of what I did. So I'm, I'm trying to have that go from light to dark in a, a fade that looks organic, I guess is the best way I can state that. And that looks good to me. So remember your bottom is kind of your practice area. And then once you get onto the, the sides, the top, the front, you'll have your method all figured out, right? So this is just one way to distress a finish. There are many ways. 
but I thought this might be kind of a fun one to experiment with. Because you're not likely to see something like this in the commercial world. And for one thing, it, it, it takes some effort to do. And it's always kind of funny in my mind, you take something that could be nice and you sort of intentionally screw it up. But that's, that's a lot of the commercial finishing right now. The fine finish is not the hallmark it once was. People want that sort of worn in, rustic, distressed look. So there I was getting pretty aggressive and I guess I sort of want it to look like it could have happened naturally. That's what I keep talking about when I'm saying organic. <laughs> if you can actually imagine any of this happening naturally. I can hear my table making lots of noise here, so I don't know if that picks up on my mic or not. I'll speed through some of this when I edit the video, but you get the idea of what I'm what I'm doing. So there you can see there's a lot of dust on that. And then, so when I look at this, that looks kind of sharp edged. These less so, that maybe needs a little blending. I just like to see that transition from black to underlying wood sort of blurry. But if you're doing this, do it what looks good to your eye. And you can put, uh, one thing I'm doing right there, I'm putting lots of pressure in one area with my thumb or my finger so I can sort of change the way it looks just with pressure on my hand. And I'm not kidding when I tell you, it, you'll, have, you'll have a good arm workout doing that. So that is the top and you can gauge that however you want, I guess. And I think I'll put a little, little wear through right up there, kind of align with this, roll around that corner a little bit and then you'll You'll see how that lightened up real fast. You can still see the direction of the grain, but uh, that blends it out a little more and then it comes up here. So move on to the side here. Again, 150 grit. I, I started on the other one with 120 but it's a little too aggressive. You don't want to show sanding scratches, or at least I didn't. I guess there's another way of distressing where you actually do show sanding scratches. You would purposely go cross grain because that, that sort of rough look is, is what you're after. It's hard for me sometimes though, because I, I look at, I spent my whole life trying to learn how to do fine finishes and then I purposely booger things up, which kind of goes against my grain, I guess. I'm just concentrating some sanding in random areas. So that's what I started with just from the sandpaper and now I'll get on to the the uh, scotch bright. And I'm rolling around the corner a little bit there to make it look like somebody brushed it every time they went down the hall for 150 years. Right? Above all, I guess, on a finish like this, I'd say suit yourself, have fun, go crazy. 
And that's kind of my whole mantra through all this, you know. Like, you don't have to do exactly what I say. Interpret it and kind of figure out the way you want to do it. So there's where we're headed. And this, these two look kind of the same to me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open one up shape-wise a little bit and change that. And that's kind of why I go at 45 degree angles. Uh, if you go exactly cross grain, it gets a real definite um, pattern. And that doesn't look organic to my eye. But maybe it does to yours. And again, I think I want a little sand through here. And maybe one up here. And there is that side done to some kind of crazy perfection. So I'm going to do the other side. When I edit this, I'll speed this all up so I won't be talking through the midst of it. Alrighty, there we've uh, been sufficiently destructive, don't you think? <laughs> so from here, we're going to dye all that. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to regroup here and uh, come back and show you how to mix dye and how to apply it. And we'll see how that turns out. So I'll be back in a few. Hey, everybody. It's Peter again, and I, uh, I have a confession to make. So the last time you saw me, I was sanding these cabinets and I sanded big patches of them off and was going for this kind of rub through finish. And my intention was to get the wood that I, un I sanded, where I sanded the paint off, to this color, this really dark indigo color. I think it would be pretty, or at least unusual looking, but the fact is, it bombed. I got to the point where I realized that I couldn't get where I wanted to go with the techniques I was using. I, my thought was to do it all with hand applied finishes. And in order to get the color intensity that I wanted on those areas, I would have had to spray it. And I think rather than going down a road that I didn't initially intend to, I thought I'd just back up and, and get back on track for a finish that you could do, you know, in your garage or something. So uh, uh, that's what I'm up to. And man, my nose always itches when, I'm, when I want to scratch it and I've got this whole thing about not touching my face and my head. So anyway, going to do a wipe on finish called dragging. And uh, I don't know if that's the official name. That's what somebody called it when they showed me how to do it. And using this product, Finish Up, and this is a water-based polyurethane. And the, the key to this is you need to have a pad that you can sort of form into a, a, something like that. This is actually an old pillowcase. And no, I didn't steal it off our bed. but. It is a pillowcase. And this is better because it doesn't have a lot of lint on it. Something like terry cloth or flannel or something like that would not be good because 
if it leaves any fiber behind in the finish, that's where it'll stay. There's, there's no wiping off of this. So the reason it's called dragging is you do just that when you put it on. And I'm going to kind of demonstrate here. I'm going to do the bottoms first, and then I'll let those dry, and then I'll flip them over and do all the top side. So when you put it on, I just, you saw me kind of rip, uh, squeeze that out. So I don't want it dripping wet. I want it wet enough to leave finish behind, but uh, I want to be able to stop it at these edges. So the way I'm going to do that is I just put it on the surface and I get my four fingers kind of acting as a platform there and I just pull across. And that's going to leave a fairly even coat. What you don't want to do is go really fast because speed here will tend to generate bubbles and if there's bubbles in it they'll stay there and this dries quick i should be able to come back to this in 10 or 15 minutes and recode it and i'm going to tip that down so maybe you can see what i'm doing a little better and you can see why it's called dragging or pulling i've heard it both ways and the idea is to go slowly but get a thorough coverage. And you can see here, now by the way, this stuff, it looks white, but it dries clear, which a lot of water-based finishes I found are. And you can also see it's actually starting to dry there. So uh, you can't take too long, but it, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's something that I guess you develop a feel for. And I've actually re-coated kitchen cabinets this way, and they can look really nice. Prep is important, but uh, let me tip that up and you can see this a little better. So I'm just using my fingers as kind of a, a uh, flat surface there and just pulling this thing across. And again, we'll build up several coats, probably put at least three coats on. So hand applied finish, but you can, with successive coats and a little prep in between coats, you can get a really nice looking finish. So that's how that's done. Like I said, I'm gonna let these dry and I just store this in here. Uh, when I was doing this in, in big areas, like a set of kitchen cabinets, I actually would get a squirt bottle and put some in there so I could just squirt it on and go and rather than have to dip in this and, and blot every time. So I'm gonna let that dry, then come back. We'll do a coat, the whole thing. And that progression will go through at least three, three cycles. And uh, we'll see how it looks then and maybe four or five. So come back in a little bit. See you soon. It's been about 10 minutes and this is dry. It's not absolutely dry, but it's, it's going to be dry enough to, to set things on. It probably would be an overnight cure kind of situation. But, and I do make a distinction between dry to touch and completely cured, and that's true of most finishes. Um, but I've used this enough to know that, that it, can, uh, it can not stick to blocks like this. So I'm going to finish this, and I'm going to try and set it up so... You can kind of see the whole thing. So I'm going to uh, finish this all the way around and, uh, and then let that dry. And, and you could do this by putting two or three coats on the bottom and then flipping over. But uh, for the sake of demonstration, uh, I'm doing it this way. And uh, one thing I should probably kind of caution you with, uh, anything, you want to make sure this is dust free. If there's any sawdust or anything on it, it, it's likely to stay there and it'll become a part of the cabinets once you put the finish on. And so we'll just go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna be sort of working over my, I hope that is easy to see. And, and you can kind of see, I've, I've got that a little too wet. So I'm squeezing some of that out. If you get runs and drips like you see coming off of that right there, you might even have a rag around that you can blot it on. And here I'm gonna point something out. See how that's built up down there? We don't want that to happen because that'll, that'll dry just like that. So damp 
even now I'm a little too wet. So I'll make a point of squeezing that and, and I'm just blotting my hand to kind of get any drips on my hand or any drips that are on this off. And you can go cross grain, but you want to finish your last stroke with grain, I think. That way, if there's any directional, and this will dry with, with a little bit of directional stuff in it. Uh, what do I want to say? I mean, it's kind of like brush marks, but obviously not a brush. So once I get it completely coated, I can drag up that whole surface. And key here is don't want to get so much liquid on the pad that it, that it forms either a, a drip on this surface or a blob on that surface. That's a technical term, blob. And because we're going to build up several coats here, the film thickness at this stage is actually just sealing that paint. And it'll be easier to build as we get successive coats on. And before, you might have seen from the camera, and I didn't notice until I, until I went around to shut the camera off, that uh, I had a drip on the front. And you can, you can just wipe that off with either this or another rag. But if, if there's a drip or a run or a sag, and now I'm getting a little dry here. This is where that squirt bottle came in, and I may, I may introduce that in the later parts of this video. You can see I'm holding this a lot of different ways. I'm going to push this forward so it's not making noise. So thoroughness and evenness of the coat is important. And there's kind of a sweet spot where you can get a nice coating on there without getting a lot of buildup. And by build up, I mean drips that would say drip off this edge here. It is the bottom, but not a good reason to finish badly the way I see it, I guess. Now you won't be able to see this, but so I'm just spreading that around, going around the porthole and the, the, uh, tube connector holes, and then I finish up with those long strokes with the grain. And in areas where there are openings, like the front and the back, you want to be careful you don't pull off a bunch of material, or I should say a, a bunch of finish into the opening. If it, if it flops in there and you get a drip inside, it actually might, uh, on the port anyway, it might not slide in as easy as it should. You know what, that's, that's probably hair splitting, but you know, I'm good at that, so. so. I'm going around the perimeter here, getting up to the edge, but not over the edge. It's that whole thing about getting the finish on and then kind of this is actually true of, of brush finishing too. Sometimes you just get it on the surface and then your last strokes are the ones that finish it off that will give it its final look, I guess you'd say. Because this stuff flattens out pretty well, surprisingly well for a hand finish. And it almost doesn't look like it because it's white when it goes on, you think, oh, that's, that's too thick. But Trust me when I tell you that uh, it, once you let it dry, and I don't know how easy that is to see. Maybe you saw it up here. When, when it looks white, it looks like it's going to be weird. Another technical term. So now I'm just getting the perimeter done here, kind of carefully so I don't get drips over the edge. You can wipe that finish on. and. What I did there, move quickly, is not a good idea because you can easily get bubbles. 
And I just pull across here. Maybe slower than you think you'd need to go. But if you introduce air and bubbles into it, it will just cause you problems later on. And for a period of time, you can go back over it. But at some point, you just got to call it good and walk away. So I am going to get the other one up here, finish it. I'll fast forward through that. And then once this is dry, we'll come back to coat number two. Oh, wait. Bleh, bleh, bleh. Hey again, folks. Uh, so these have been drying. I let these dry about an hour. And from here on in, that first coat kind of soaks in, dries really fast. From subsequent coats, coats, because that's now sealed, will take longer to dry. So uh, the instructions on the, on the uh, bottle actually say an hour dry time. And from here on in, that's kind of what I'll be doing. So I'm going to... Just basically do the same thing over again. And I just cap this between, between coats. And it, it keeps pretty well. I, I wouldn't expect it to keep for any length of time. But uh, one thing I thought I'd do here is show you, and this may not be something you have around, but uh, rather than dipping this in there and having to kind of blot it, I. Uh, I will sometimes use deals like this, especially on bigger projects, so you can kind of control the amount that you're putting on there. And then just back to the same, same drill. Um, probably the easiest way is to sort of spread it around, get right up to the edges without getting drips over the edge. And get it on there and, and I might go across grain and just any which way to get it wet and then immediately drag it with the grain. Most hand finishes are kind of slow to build. I could probably put a little more on this, a little wetter. In fact, I think I'll just show you that now that the rag is stuck to my hand. And you can do this if you do it immediately. You don't want to do this if, if it starts tacking up. Uh, the, the, the window to put more finish on is closed at that point. By tacking up, I mean drying. And again, you want to be careful not to get drips over the edge. And if you do, if you do get drips over the edge, it's not the end of the world. You can just take your finger and go like that, assuming you're wearing gloves. And by the way, I'd recommend you wear gloves. You're going to get really sticky hands. And this stuff is, is tough, so uh, it take a long time to wear off. So I'm going to do this other one and then let these dry for an hour. Then So these are the bottoms. And uh, I'll do this one and then flip them over and do the, the, the whole, all the other sides. There goes my alarm telling me it's time to recode them. <clears throat> so it's a little early. One thing going across the grain will tend to do is to get it down in the grain. 
sort of scrapes the finish off when you're doing that off into the grain. And one thing about a finish like this, you're intended to see that, or it's intended that you see the grain. So it looks, they often refer to this, or they used to anyway, as black ash. Now, ash would be the ideal wood to use because the grain would be open like this is, but a little bit uh, more pronounced in many cases, especially with hardwood. And there, you can kind of see what that looks like after it's coated. And so the appeal to a finish like this is that it, it looks grainy, but it's not, it's not colored like wood, obviously. So that's it for now. I'm going to come back in an hour and then put a coat on all the rest of it. And then I'll probably just coat, since it's the same thing over and over, I'll, I'll just kind of do it without filming it and then when we get near the end, I'll, I'll kind of catch you up on, on what I've done. So I'll see you soon. Okay, it's an hour later, and uh, so the bottoms are dry. And one thing I should probably point out, this is going to look, until we start to get a little bit more film build, this will look kind of uh, patchy and mottled. It won't be an even sheen. So it just... Just so you know, it's, it'll get there, but it takes a little bit. So we're just going to do the same thing did last time. And uh, I'll do one. You get to watch me put my gloves on. I'll do one in regular speed, and then I'll, I'll blast through the other one. So up on the blocks. And the, and the blocks do something kind of nice. If, if you happen to get a drip, like I said, you can just run your finger along there and kind of wipe it off. Uh, I wouldn't make a big effort to get it wiped off with a rag because all you're trying to do is, is spread it out, really, not, not really remove it completely. So same drill. We want it wet but not dripping wet. And we'll go ahead and start on the front since that's the way I have it. This really is a convenient way to do this if you happen to have a squirt bottle around. Um, I know I sometimes show stuff that isn't easy to come by, but I, I think you could probably get that maybe in, maybe not one like that, but one that would work in maybe cosmetic section of a store. Uh, assuming you even want to go in a store right now. So again, I'm just spreading it around, getting it everywhere, and then I'll drag over the top of it. And I was reading the instructions, believe it or not, a guy reading instructions, and they say you can put it on with a cellulose sponge. I have never done that. I'm not even sure I know what a cellulose sponge is. I guess that's maybe a non-sea sponge or something. Um, and I've never tried it. And I, I've never, someone actually showed me how to use this product that was from Mohawk. And they were showing me with a rag, so I, I guess take that for whatever it's worth. If you want to try it with a cellulose sponge, you can let me know how it works. How's that? And you'll see that looks kind of streaked. I don't know if that shows up in the camera, but from my vantage point, it looks like there's almost brush strokes but they will go away. I, I guarantee you, uh, you will not be able to see them. And black's going to show them up worse than anything. When you're doing this on, assuming you did do it, on um, cabinetry that was wood and not black like this, it, uh, it wouldn't be, it'd be very forgiving. Colors like this, and especially black, solid colors as opposed to you know, wood stain or something, really show up flaws in the finish. And with every coat, I'm getting a little more film build. And I like to go slow on this stuff. To me, speed is not the goal. Um, ultimately, what you want is a really nice, smooth finish. And depending on how you 
are doing this, there might be a period of time that you'd want to do a little bit of scuffing between coats. It, it helps the finish stick and it, it might be that there's something you actually want to take out of there. Why is it that our noses itch when we're not supposed to touch our faces? I don't know. I hope that's evident to the camera that you can kind of see the, the lines and then obviously I'm going against the grain so that's not where we'll end up but it might look like I'm not following my own advice here. But what you see there, especially in the last part of my stroke, I don't know how evident that is, but you can definitely see little lines of that and they will go away. Um, I, I don't know how better to explain it. it. It does. It really does. Trust me. They actually probably don't go away, but they show up because of this stuff looks white and when it gets clear, they're not going to be as obvious. In fact, they're not going to be obvious at all in my experience. But we're definitely doing something. <laughs> I guess now that I think about it, this is a first two. I don't think I've ever put this finish over black. So fortunately, it's not bombing like the, like the other one that I attempted. All right, so we got the back sides and now the top. One cool thing about this finish is it's tough. And polyurethane in general is tough. This stuff seems really, really durable. So I, I don't know what you'd be doing with your speakers that you need that kind of durability, but kind of nice to know that if you move them from house to house or around the room or to another room or something like that, that you're not going to be risking them. Uh, they're not going to be frail, let's put it that way. Because who wants frail speakers, right? Okay, I set that on my drying rack. And... I'm going to blow through this one and, and sign off and come back after an hour. And you saw me just blot that right there. I know I'm going to be spreading that around, so I just kind of rubbed off some excess. Some of these things I do without thinking. I mean, it's not like I'm in the habit of talking to video cameras. It's getting more normal for me, but it always seems kind of weird to stare at a camera and talk to it as if it were a human. At least for me it's weird. I suppose I'll get more and more used to it. And I am getting more and more used to it, I suppose. One thing I have noticed about this finish, they call this flat. And it does not seem as flat as what I would call it flat. It, it seems more like the, the dull end of satin, I suppose.
Okay, we'll call that good, let that dry an hour, come back and see how it looks and continue on. See you soon. Hey folks, here I am, back with more black ash speakers, actually black oak speakers. Anyway, um, so to kind of catch up, this is coat number four, and I did something uh, just to, when I, I, I ran a uh, piece of Scotch-Brite over these after coat number two, and some of the sanding dust that got down into the grain, and I had a little bit of concern that that would show up lighter. And um, I, I, that may have been unfounded, but so what I decided to do, because I'm always about experimenting, was I mixed a little, this is water soluble dye. This is called Transfast, and it's from the same people that make Transtint. And uh, this is only water soluble. So it's powder, and I probably put Oh, this was maybe a half inch. I'm going to guess that was maybe two ounces of, of the uh, finish up and probably a pencil eraser or so worth of this. This stuff is really concentrated. So what it turns out to be, and, and this looks gray in the bottle, but bear in mind that this, the stuff when it goes on is whitish and when it dries, it dries clear. So I tinted coats three and four, and these actually look pretty good at this point. I mean, many people would probably look at this and say, well, this is good enough. And, uh, but you know me, man, always striving for the, <laughs> the higher rung on the ladder. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, scuff sand these with a gray Scotch-Brite, and then I'm gonna coat them with two coats of clear. I'll, uh, I'll just dump this out and put clear in this thing. And I also discovered a, an easier way to sort of get this stuff onto the surface in bulk as opposed to just putting it on with the rag. And uh, so I'm gonna quickly sand these, then I'll kind of get set up and, and show you that technique of coating which I think works a little better. And, and one thing I should probably point out too, as you do this, the surface will get more and more even in sheen. In the beginning, it really looks like something is going wrong, but it's just because the coats are so thin and going on so, uh, what do I want to say, that, that you still get some of that non-glossy area showing through, but it eventually gets to an even gloss. And there's a slight bit of modeling right now, but uh, I think I can take that completely away with a couple of coats on top of the clear. And they look really, really black, which is what I was which, uh, going for. So uh, let me scuff these up and I'll talk through one. And this is not anything more than just putting a little bit of a, uh, a scratch on the surface. And they should be smooth at this point. If, they, if they're not smooth, you might actually want to sand them. But this just puts a little scuff on the surface so that the uh, Next coats have something to, to stick to. And you'll notice I'm not even going with the grain. This is not going to show as a sanding scratch like sandpaper would. And after I do this, I'll run what's called it, and I don't know if I've ever mentioned it, uh, but there's a, a sticky rag called a tack rag, and I think it's got wax on it, and uh, I'll show you in just a second here. And I always run a tack rag after sanding, or it, it may not be necessary in a case like this, but what it does is pick up any loose particles. So I think that's all of it, isn't it? You want to be careful when you do this that you don't roll over the edges because you can take that uh, edge off really fast. This one I'll fast forward through when I edit. And this is a tack rag. And you can see I've, I've used that and it's picking up. And I, I think this is, they're pretty simple things. I, I understand some people will actually make them, but this has got some kind of tacky, waxy stuff on it. You can get these at paint stores. I'll, I'll find some online and link to them. But 
by just lightly going over that, it just picks up whatever residue that the, the uh, Scotch-Brite pad left behind, which isn't much. If you're sanding heavily, more heavily with, with sandpaper, you'd see more on the tack rag. This just makes sure that the idea is not to introduce any particles into the surface that would show up as, well, that show up as trapped particles. So the idea here is to get a finish that looks like it could have been sprayed but was hand applied. So there's, there's a way to get there, I think. It, it, the, what spraying does is just speed things up. You can get more finish on the surface and you can get a uh, faster build up. And, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of people watching this don't have spray equipment. So that's kind of why I'm doing it. So uh, the next I'm gonna uh, kind of get set up here and uh, we'll, uh, we'll coat these with clear one coat and then I'll let that, actually I'll do the bottoms first like I did before. And then we'll do one coat with clear, do the rest of the cabinet after that. Then, th then we'll do a final coat. <laughs> did, I, did I look like I was getting confused? Yeah, anyway, so we'll come back. See you soon. We are back in the saddle again. I uh, uh, dumped out the dyed finish up and got a new fresh rag. There's what the old one looked like. And I'm just gonna put a clear coat on the bottoms, which are what's up now, and then let that dry and then come back and do the tops. So same thing as before. But uh, one thing that I found that was kind of useful, this wasn't absorbing enough. I can see why they say a sponge and I never have looked into that, but uh, to, in order to, to get enough on the surface, I ha kept having to dip that in and or, or do this, which, which is a workable way of doing it, but I found, especially when I'm working on a, a horizontal surface like this, that I actually can take a little with this bottle and, and put it right on there. I don't know if that's obvious to the camera. Let me tip that up a little bit. I don't want it to run over the edge, but that's what I'm doing. It's just getting, and that's exactly what I did want it to happen. <clears throat> I leave my mistakes in here so you can hopefully learn from them. So first I'm just spreading that around. I want this to be wet because when, when you start dragging this dry, it, it'll leave streaks. And so I want these last coats to be pretty wet coats. So I'm getting it spread all over the whole surface first and then drag it. And that should give a nice smooth finished surface and any irregularities in the, the surface finish will be running with the grain. And this, I, like I said, I, I think there's a different ways of getting this and you'll see all the black on the outside. That's just from my hands before. And I'll, I'll see if I can find those online and, and link to them in the, uh, in the description, which, which by the way, I always try and do if I'm using stuff that's not real easy to find, or even if it is easy to find, I'll, I'll try and give you at least a manufacturer's link and from there you can usually get to a vendor's link depending on where you are in the world. Okay, that's it. We'll let that dry. So that's going to dry an hour. Then I'll come back, flip them over and we'll do the rest. See you soon. It's magically one hour later, maybe an hour and 10 minutes, maybe even 15. Anyway, so I flipped this back over, or flipped it over. It was sitting on the top, so we did the bottom, and now I'm gonna do the rest of the sides. And uh, I'll just show this one, how I do it, and I'm, I'm gonna kinda of try and work around the side here so you, so you can see it. And, um, and then I'll, I'll speed through the other one, just assume that I'm doing the same thing. 
So the way I found to do this that seems to work pretty well, and drips that go off the bottom are not going to be your friend. So I'm actually putting that on as lightly as I can like that and then catching it before it goes off the bottom. And what I'm trying to do is to get a, a, a fair amount of material on there without having a dripping wet applicator. So what I'm doing at first is just getting it spread everywhere and then pulling that surface. And I'm actually forming my fingers to go around that radius a little bit. And then I'll pull the other direction. Just because I got a little build up at the top, as I pulled off right up here, I was getting some little bubbles. Usually those will go away but this, this makes me feel better, so <laughs> indulge me. So you can still do it this way. On the front, because of the driver holes, this might actually be a better way. You don't want to get drips hanging off anywhere. And if you do get drips, uh, one of the easy ways to do it is make sure your hand is not wet with material. You can just take your finger and run across there like that and if it, if there's any drips, it'll it'll uh, take them off in a way that doesn't affect the way the cabinet looks. Does that make sense? I don't know. Anyway, it's an easy way to get rid of them if you get them, and I have during this process. I mean, it's it's pretty difficult to do it without at least getting that to happen once or twice because this is. This is coat number four on here, so plenty of opportunities, I guess. One thing I may do, I was looking at the, uh, let's see, maybe I can turn this a little bit. I'm just trying to make it so it's a little easier to see from the camera angle. Without having it fallen over. So I'm just dragging that back and forth. You can kind of hopefully see that, and I'm catching those drips before they run off. And it doesn't hurt to be holding this down if you're standing it up on blocks like I am. And that's helpful. And you can see I got a drip right there. Um, so I'm going to quickly run my hand across and spread that out so it doesn't form a, a drop underneath because that'll dry hard and you'll assuming you want to remove it you'll have to sand it off. Sometimes after I'm all done I'll run my hand around my my dried hand you want to make sure you're not applying material with your finger and just drag around the outside and you can look at your hand and see if you've dragged off any drips they'll be wet on your on your glove. I'm using your and mine interchangeably. So when I, when I talk about we, I guess what I really mean is me. Oh, one thing I was going to say, um, I'm just going to go ahead and talk while I do the back. The, uh, I really liked the way that the, the, this finish, because of what it is, water-based, it, unlike oil-based finishes and most solvent-based finishes, it doesn't have any color to it. It doesn't have any amber tone to it. And um, consequently, things look kind of cold. And it almost looks whitish or bluish. And that's been a, an issue with a lot of water-based finishes. They, they don't bring any warmth to the table. And in some cases, they're actually adding amber color to water-based finishes so that they do bring or warmth, warmth, I can say that, warmth to the table. 
And uh, just looking at the, the way the cabinet turned out with the clear only, I am really thinking I like it just a smidgen better with the black dye in it. Normally, you want color coats underneath and clear coats on top for protection. But in this case, since we're not talking about a countertop or a high wear surface, I may on the last and final coat tint the finish again. And that's purely subjective on my part. It's what I what I think I see is a little bit of a a blue cast and I really don't want that. I want it to be black, really black. And almost done here. Just taking a couple air bubbles away. And I'm gonna set that aside. I'm gonna do the other one and we'll speed through that. And then uh, I'll think about if I'm gonna put dye in the last coat or not. You saw me blow into the uh, tube connector hole because I got a drip in there and if I let it dry, it would interfere with installing the, the connector and I'd have to somehow dig it out of there, either run a drill bit through it or something like that. Okay, we'll call that good and uh, the next coat will be the final coat and will be the final coat. And I think I probably will use dye on the last one. I just think it looks a little bit blacker. So, see you soon. All right, these have been sitting for um, uh, an hour and a half, something like that. And uh, before I put the last coat on, like I, I decided to put some black dye into this because I actually think it makes them look a little nicer and uh, I guess I can, so I am. So I thought I'd show how I mix that up. There's just very little, that's about a, a half an inch of finish in the bottom of this. So I would guess that to be uh, maybe a couple of ounces, maybe three ounces. And I realize these recipes aren't exact, but it, it's just my way. <laughs> so I'm going to use this uh, popsicle stick as a, a spoon here and that gives you an idea how much dye I'm going to put in there. Not as much as you might think. It, this stuff goes a long, long way. It's really, really concentrated. And you'll see when I start shaking this how how that colors that. So you can, you saw before the, the uh, color of that. Now I'm just gonna mix it up a little bit. If you're doing something like this, I'd always recommend, I mean, they, they probably give some recommendations on, on where to start, but you can just squirt it out on something, a little drip and let it dry and see what it looks like. So um, it's not too hard. Better to work up to it than try and dilute it after the fact. And I would give that, I'm just looking in there to make sure that's diluted. It takes a little bit of time for that dye to completely dilute in there. So I might be rushing things a little bit here. Pretty much a surprise from me rushing anything, huh? All right, so we're gonna, Proceed and, and you can kind of see now what that looks like in there. Definitely has a, 
a black cast to it. So I'm going to go back to the rag I was using before, which I've kept from drying out. One nice thing about this finish is you can, throughout the whole process, um, you can use, just use a cup or a, a container like this. This is a cottage cheese container and, and button it up uh, between coats and even overnight it, it shouldn't dry out, even though that's not a super tight seal, I don't think. <clears throat> so, there I kind of re-wetted my, my uh, applicator. And so I'm going to do the bottoms and I'm going to do it the way I talked about. Let's get the polyurethane on there, get it spread around, sort of evenly distributed, and then drag it. And this should be last coat. So once this dries and cures, this should be a nice looking finish. It should be really durable too. Polyurethane is tough. One of the things I don't like about it is it doesn't have, it, it kind of makes things look plastic. And I'm gonna put just a little more on here. You might've heard me say something in the last segment about you want this to be wet. And, and I'm, I'm definitely trying to put this on wet for this final coat because I want it to fill as much as possible, but still flatten out. And there's a window of time where you can do what I'm doing here. But if it starts to drag, if you feel it dragging on your, on your applicator, you're just near the end of its workable time. I hope I'm describing that right. I'm kind of putting pressure on myself to try and make these videos a little shorter. And uh, so there's one. And I'll fast forward through this one. And we're good. I am going to let those dry an hour, come back and put a final coat on uh, both of them. And then we'll see how they look. Should be done there. You could put another coat on. You could put several more coats on if you were of a mind to. But once you get beyond a certain point, it, it starts looking less like wood and more like plastic. So catch up with you soon. Hey everybody, it's Peter again. And uh, look at this. We have mostly completed speakers. Uh, well, speakers that are driverless and crossoverless, but boxes nonetheless. And uh, uh, so I left off, I think, the fourth coat. And, and uh, bear in mind that, that I do these segments as uh, when I edit them, I put them all together. But uh, it's been about three or four days since I actually put the last coat on here. So if I'm covering ground twice, that's, that's why. And uh, so I, I tinted the last coat, I put it on, just let them dry. And then just before I, I shot this video, I took a microfiber cloth. And you wanna be sure and get these really bright green microfiber cloths, cause boy, do they ever work good. And you know, that's nonsense, right? <laughs> It doesn't matter what color your microfiber cloth is. These are really bright. I don't know. And they're easy to find, I guess. But uh, so I, I often use it. Microfiber is cool in that regard. You can, you can buff finishes with it and it, it sort of evens out sheen sometimes. And so um, like I did in the last one, I just wanted to call one thing. There's only really a, a couple of things that I have to say that I didn't love the way it turned out. And that is, one of them has to do with the water-based finishes. Um, I'm sure that there's stuff out there that doesn't do this, but these water-based finishes, excuse me, because they uh, like the, the finish up that I used, it's white when it comes out of the bottle and it, it looks 
terrible when you first apply it, but the theory is that it will get clear as it dries. And it does for the most part, but there is an ever so slight kind of whitish cast that it leaves behind that I don't like the look of. And it looks especially bad to my eye on black, because blacks in my mind should be deep, inky black, not grays and that's kind of what it makes it look like. It almost looks like you're looking through a, a piece of glass that was sandblasted or something. It just doesn't have that pureness of color and that's why I added the, the black tint to it and um, I maybe should have finished another one alongside these just to see if I could tell the difference but I'm pretty sure I could. I could see it coming through on that third coat and that's why I decided to tint it. So um, expect that, but I don't know if you'd even notice it inside of a house. Under my lighting in here, it, it shows up all the, the warts on, on whatever I'm doing. And that's intentional. I want good lighting that, that renders color well and, and that's what I intended here. But, um, honestly, unless I get these in just the right light, I don't even see that. So there is one thing. The other thing, of course, is the Magnificent Bomb that I tried with the original finish that I was going to do, which was the, the rubbed off, distressed finish. <laughs> it, was, it was a total flop. I absolutely broke my own cardinal rule and I went to work on that thinking I could stain the wood to that intense blue that I wanted. Not gonna happen. The only way to make that happen is how I would have done it otherwise would have been to spray either tint the finish or put uh, what's called tint coats on, which is just basically dye in, in uh, solvent. And, and then I can build it up in layers. But when you're trying to take brownish yellow wood and turn it blue, that, it, it again, well, back to the lens analogy, you need to be looking through that blue because the likelihood that you're gonna turn that wood blue with any kind of stain or dye is, is not very good. Suffice to say, learn from my mistakes, and that was indeed a mistake, and I'll, I'll probably edit some of that and, and put it at the end of the video so you, you can watch me flop if you want to. And, uh, but these by and large turned out pretty good. I, uh, I think this is something, you know, that most people would be okay with having in their house or their office or, you know, whatever. So, um, I'm going to call that good for now and, uh, everybody stay safe. This COVID-19 thing is, is, uh, it looks to me no joke. Um, and I'm not going to go on and on about it, but, uh, Let's, uh, let's all uh, be thinking about everybody else these days. I think it's important to, to bear in mind that uh, we share the planet with other people. <laughs> and, and if we're not going to uh, really booger it up, then uh, th this, this whole, what are they calling it, the, the staying at home thing is, is worthwhile. So here I am staying at home, making videos and finishing speaker cabinets. So maybe you can do the same. Stay safe, folks. I really mean that. Bye now. Now for more craziness. I uh, got a piece of cardboard. I get, I get the boxes that I ship XLS flat packs in, in another box and they're these nice big pieces of cardboard so they work out good for this. They're absorptive and they add a little cushion and they keep me from um, making a mess on top of my beautiful bench top, right? So here we are. We're to the uh, coloring stage and I'm going to do this in blue 
It's gonna be unusual, it might look weird. I guess we'll see. Uh, one thing that I can tell you that's a pretty sure thing, I got something in my cup there. Um, if, if you want it to look a little more natural, you'd get a little closer to wood color. So I'd say browns, brown blacks. I've never tried it with gray, but gray on top of brown usually doesn't work out too well because you're, you're mixing a warm, uh, cold color, cool color together. So I'm going to be experimenting here. Um, this, like I said, I've never finished speakers like this before. So the one thing I will caution is in case you have to mix up more, this would probably be best measured in some way. And you can do that by drops out of the bottle and ounces out of the, out of the uh, gallon here. then regroup and, and see what we can do to intensify that color a little bit. I let that dry and then I flipped it over and what I'm going to do is I'm going to coat everything so it's all the same and that way whatever effect I have and I can't undo this so at this point I'm committed so you get to watch me uh, roll with the punch, I guess. In my mind's eye, that actually looked really cool. But this is why it'd be a good idea to do sample boards, huh? So maybe, maybe I should title this something like Experiments with Peter. Not exactly science experiments, but finish experiments. Well, folks, this looks like a really complete bomb. I, uh, I gotta be honest and tell you, I don't like the way they look at all. And I think if I were to clear over the top of this, it would look a little better, but still look like uh, your third grader did it. So I'm going to pursue one avenue here and what I did was I put some pigment. Now this is exactly the color I want but the difficulty I'm having is the accepting, the even acceptance of that dye into the wood and now I'm even starting and, and I, I changed my technique a little bit. I, uh, rather than using the brush which just flooded the surface I wanted to be able to control it a little more, so I started using a rag, and it's pretty color, isn't it? Here's a failed experiment. I, I'm sure a lot of you are watching for techniques that you can actually use and not the ones that you can ruin your uh, speakers with. So I'm not, I wanted, I wanted that color. I think I bombed, to be honest. Uh, this is a botch. I would say this is not a workable, not all experiments turn out the way you think they will. And I wish this were different, but uh, I think at this point, going back to paint actually might be a better plan.